Hi, I'm Roshan Ormond and you're listening to Hearthsworth Energia AIL Rugby Show brought to you by Energia. Think of the possibilities. Welcome back to the Hair Sport Energy AIL Rugby Show brought to you by Energy. My name is Alana Canan and I'm joined as always by Hannah Tyrrell. How are you keeping Hannah? Yeah, good. Looking forward to all the rugby that's ahead. There is plenty to get into as usual. Not quite as much as the last time, <laughs> but a few game weeks anyways ahead of us here today. Um, and then obviously as well, we've the Six Nations to look forward to. The squad was recently announced there um, just last week. So plenty of talking points around that one too, Hannah. What, would your, what were your taking, or talking points away from it? Yeah, look, I think um, it's an interesting squad. Uh, It has a really good mix of some experienced players, obviously, once again, led by the two co-captains, Adele Tricky McMahon and Sam Monaghan. Um, But a couple of new faces and uncapped faces in there, the likes of Chisholm Aguero, you know, being rewarded for her fine form in the AIL. And then, um, you know, the likes of Claire Gorman, who's been playing well um, in the... Uh, Celtic Cup and also has been around a little bit so um, look Scott Bamand is trying to I suppose pick a squad that he feels have maybe performed well both for club country and for their provinces and in this um, you know challenge cup the last couple of weeks but he also has to pick a squad that will be up to the demands of international rugby because it is a a big step up um, you know just because you've played well over the last couple of weeks with all the rugby that's been on doesn't mean that you're going to be suited to international rugby but I'm excited about some of the girls in this squad Um, I think it's interesting as you mentioned earlier that um, you know before the the um, they started that the sevens girls are back in I think mm. that's an interesting one because it's an Olympic year and you know I didn't expect to see the likes of Eve Parsons Avian Ry- or <laughs> Eve Higgins uh, Avian Parsons or Avian Riley being um named in this squad considering you know all their focuses on on the summer but I actually think it's good because they bring a wealth of experience you know they're insanely talented and skilled and um, you know it's a good addition to the squad. As I say yeah quite a lot of ins and outs that way obviously you had the comeback of the sevens girls with the Olympics on the horizon nobody expected to see that Nicole Fowley and the likes back in and then you've uh, O'Leary and O'Connor who you wouldn't have expected to be um, I suppose on the outside of things they're on the training panel so quite a lot of changes and I suppose that's to be expected under Scott Beeman's first Six Nations he's trying to trial a few things out yeah look he's um, still within his first year and, and trying to get uh, trying to pick a squad that he thinks as I said is up to the demands of international rugby and he's still probably getting used to a lot of his players and trying to understand um, you know how they play and how they fit into a system that he wants to play and what we're seeing is that patterns are beginning to emerge and it's it's interesting. I was quite surprised to see the likes of Maeve O'Gallery um, and more so Hannah O'Connor named in the training squad. Um, for me, Hannah O'Connor, she's been around a very long time and for an, an international squad that has been lacking in a lot of experience uh, and leadership over the last um, little while and just you know, with so many new young players coming in to have someone like her in the squad who is just a natural leader and who does, you know, pick up and do the grunt work that we need and lead us forward at times. That That's quite an interesting one, but it highlights to me the depth that he thinks that he has in the back row that he's able to leave out, uh, both Maeve O'Gallery and Hannah O'Connor. Maeve Vogue probably a little bit um, unfortunate. She's been out with injury quite a while, only just recently returned, but also... Um, in the fact that the position she plays when you have a co-captain who's primarily a seven and your role is primarily a seven it's very very hard to get in there and it's quite a specialized position uh, and a lot of time in the back row you're looking for players who um can play in more than one position and i feel like she may have just been pushed out a little bit because of that um, and you know it's given opportunities to other players um I do like that we have a training panel. I think it's great to bump up numbers and give other girls experience. The likes of India, da- India Daily, I thought, played quite well in the um, 
Celtic Challenge Cup, you know, and has been rewarded for that. And same for Kate Flannery, who, mm. look, I, I've talked about uh, before in this show and how well she's been going for UL Bows. She also has come into the um, Clovers team and done quite well in a, a very challenging position at 10, uh, where she's primarily played. And for her, this is an opportunity to come in, learn the roles and what it's like at international rugby, get some of the... Um, the key words and movement patterns and all in without actually having any pressure of playing and having to perform um, on the international stage while so young. Uh, on the flip side of that, it would have been great to see her in there, but Scott has felt like the likes of Dana and Nicole are uh, up to the standards of 10 and obviously Enya Breen back in after mm. um, her ACL injury can also slot in there if needed. So it's an opportunity for her to learn on the go. And... Um, Another player I'm really, really, really excited to see, and she's been tearing it up in the in the uh, Celtic Challenge Cup, is Katie Carrigan. Uh, again, talked about it before, incredible speed, really good footwork, just seems to have a knack to find the try line. She played five times in the Celtic Challenge Cup and scored 12 tries. Um, you know, still really, really young, but she's one idea, Mark, um, that will get a lot of game time, I personally think, um, considering... A lot of our back three players that have previously played in the last few years are away with sevens. I think it could be a huge opportunity. I'd throw her in on the wing for the very first game and just say, show me what you can do and don't be afraid. Um, but it's exciting. We have a couple of um, really young and up-and-coming front rowers, which is exciting to see. The likes of Sarah Delaney's come up through the 20s pathways and um, we need, and like Cy McGraw, obviously, and them kind of got their first taste last year. This is where we want to build on these guys and really set ourselves up in the front row and in tricky, tricky positions for the next couple of years. So perhaps in that way he's kind of favouring a bit of versatility as well. I know it's quite funny, like we spoke to Energy Ambassadors, Linda Dujan, Brittany Hogan and Hugo Keenan, um, in the last couple of weeks but speaking to Linda like she's automatically become one of the more experienced players on the squad but she was only saying she was like look sure I only have 30 something caps it's a lot of caps and <laughs> an international level they're definitely all valued but it is such a young squad and they're growing into it like yeah look um and as you say to get one cap for your country is brilliant to get over 30 is obviously unbelievable um but when you compare that to the likes of England and France um and even Wales and Scotland the the amount of caps that some of their players have are into the hundreds mm. um, you know and we are far behind that I think and I might be just off on this but I think Claire Malloy might be our most capped player ever at about high 70s maybe early 80s um, and you know there's multiple players in English camp who have over 100 caps and we're just a little bit behind in experience and all that but that look obviously the more matches they play the more caps they get and the more experience they, they will get but we are a young team we are learning and this is very much a transition phase for Ireland and will be for the next number of years it's just about building on that year on year and improving first game on game and then year on year and making sure that our trajectory is always upwards We'll be coming back to this the next episode, but uh, just to touch on as well, one of the big chat points on Twitter anyways was the inclusion of obviously Chisamu Guerrero, who has been, who has been under, or unbelievable for UL Bows, but UL Bows, top of the energy AIL, yet only one player in the squad, what do you think? Yeah, look, it's tough going, I suppose. Injuries probably played a part in a couple of that. Um, obviously, uh, Nicole Cronin has been uh, involved in Irish squads for the last number of years and is now injured. And then previously you've had the likes of Chloe Pierce and, and co. But um, it is tough. You look at the table and you say, this team's doing well, but it seems like they're not being rewarded. And sometimes it's, it's genuinely just pure bad luck that mm. someone in a certain position, say for UL Bows, is playing very, very well but we already have player too many players in that position who maybe have a little bit better experience and who know the system already and Scott has already gotten to know, et cetera, et cetera. And you've just missed out in that way. Mm. Other aspects of it are that, um, and this is, again, not a slide on UL Bows, that they took advantage at the start of the season when WXV3 was on and had their core group of players when they weren't missing so many from the international setup to... Um, build up their really good team connections, put in some really good performances when other teams were missing uh, players and then were able to build on that momentum and confidence throughout when all the WXV3 players mm. um, returned. I think, uh, 
Look, realistically, only Scott can answer those questions on why more UL bold players weren't uh, put in there. But I do think one or two were very, very close. The likes of Alana uh, McInerney, I thought, did very, very well um, in for the Clovers in the in the Challenge Cup and um, can probably consider themselves a little bit unlucky. But that's not to say that in the future they aren't getting there. Maybe just Scott doesn't think they're they're quite there yet, you know. Yeah, plenty of time yet as well over the coming years. But as you mentioned, the Celtic Challenge, the Wolfhounds came out on top of that one, beating the Clovers. Does that suggest maybe, I suppose, a developing period in Irish rugby that those two Irish teams were the ones in the final, do you think? Yeah, the system was a little bit strange uh, this year in that first they played their, I think, six rounds it was of this league table. And then instead of going kind of straight to a, just a, a final with two teams, they went to like a three-way playoff um, where they all just played each other once. And it kind of ended a little bit anticlimactic. So it was the two Irish teams, the Wolfhounds, the Clovers, and then Edinburgh Rugby as well, who in fairness to them, um, put out some really good strong teams this year. Their most recent team included Scottish International and Sevens International, Rona Lloyd, uh, which shows that they were putting a bit of emphasis and seriousness into it uh, as much as, as we were. But for the Wolfhounds and Clovers, it's great to be up there, but based on some of the standards we'd seen from other teams, they should have been up there. Uh, but again, it was an opportunity to give a lot of Irish players um, a lot of game time at an increased level than the AIL. Um, and then also putting them out, themselves out there. And I think a big benefit that Irish rugby will take from this um, Celtic Challenge Cup is that with the two teams, like the Wolfhounds being primarily Ulster and Leinster, and with the Clovers being primarily um, Connacht and Munster, it actually gave players an opportunity to play with each other mm. who either they've never played with before or who they only would have played with in an Irish shirt. And so what that does is the more you play with a player, the more you get to understand how they like to play, what way they're going to be playing, and you end up on the same page. So that will all translate into much better phase play um, and performances and like um, when we go into the Six Nations, which can only help us a little bit. Look, great for the Wolfhounds to come out and get the win, but as I said, it it actually gave us an opportunity to see some really good young talents, as I mentioned, like the, like Kay Flannery, like uh, Katie Carrigan, uh, Fate of Wayu, who did really, really well, um, India Daly and co, who stepped up and because of that are getting a chance in a green jersey. And it'll allow for that ever-expanding pool that we seem to be constantly talking about here as well. Yeah, look, again, um, we're a little bit behind from other nations and that, and we're always looking to try and develop um, and our pathways from minis right to out, and that is helping with, in the past year or so, with the under-18s and under-26 nations and all the rest. But yeah, as I said, experience and match experience cannot be matched by anything else, by no amount of Irish camps or no amount of club training and uh, provincial training matches are where you get your experience and players get better and they make mistakes and can then learn from those mistakes to improve and plenty of those matches anyways in the energy at AIL have a looking at the most recent table there UL Bows are at the top with 53 points Railway Union 47 Old Belvo 41 and Black Rock in fourth there on 35 Ballon Colleagues Setonians and Galwegians then following those up and then Cook and Wicklow at the bottom of the table UL Bows are just on fire. Yeah, look, as I said, um, they're a really well-run team. Um, they have a lot of players who have either represented Ireland before or, again, previously played in the uh, Celtic Ca- Challenge Cup or um, have played to a high degree of provincial level. And they just play some really nice rugby. They know each other really well. Their uh, camaraderie and all that is, is quite good. And it leads to these really good performances. And I think when you're winning and you're um, on that kind of momentum role, it really helps with that confidence going into the next game and in fairness to them they're favourites to win uh, right now look obviously there's still a good few rounds to go but um, they have been the team to beat and they've, they've knocked down any challenges that come before them Definitely, and 58-5 to the score when they played Galwegians in Curly Park on the 10th of February. We were actually at that one, so we'll have a little documentary coming your way sometime soon on Galwegians. But for Galwegians, it must be very disheartening to have them won the plate and then come back into the energy at AIL, and then two heavy losses we're talking about there. The UL Bowes one, we'll talk about shortly, the Railway Union result as well. How will that have affected them, do you think? 
Yeah, look, uh, these are difficult times for Dave Clark, uh, the women's head coach, and uh, for Galwegians themselves as well. They're just severely lacking, I think, in, in leadership and in experienced players. Obviously, Nicole Fowley's been out for quite a while since the WXV3 tournament. She is a huge talisman for them. And um, not only that, when they're in pressure situations, she has a huge boot that's able to get them out of... Um, out of those situations and give them a little bit of relief defensively, I suppose. And um, they're kind of missing the likes of, we had a very, very brief um, return from Raid Coyne. She obviously wasn't there then the last couple of games. And, and you can see that there is that leadership lacking. Mary Healy's not been playing for them as well either. And I think in recent times, Orla Dixon has stepped away as, as well. And I think they're just really struggling with, I suppose, a transition period. Mm. Um, you know, some of these games last year, they'd put up much more of a fight. Um, you know, they definitely wouldn't be losing with these kind of margins. And I think for them, it's about trying to retain the players they have, just trying to improve their core skills, trying to figure out what way do they want to play and getting that performance on a consistent basis. It might not always end up in positive results, but if you're getting uh, a little bit more positive performances, at least for some parts of the game, you will continue to improve, but uh, it is quite tough for Dave Clark and, and his crew, and even for the, the Galwegians girls, like they don't want to go out and, and end up on the wrong side of those results time after time, and it was a tough couple of weeks for them with those two losses. Mm, especially that UL Bowles result, because um, just starting out, I know obviously we were do- down doing the documentary, and honestly such a welcoming club, like it's going to be brilliant, so I'm telling you, keep the eyes peeled, but <laughs> um, no, like they seem so, they have such a young squad, and they're all trying to get together and get those results, and like I know we mentioned before, coming on air here, that um, obviously they have players like Grace Brown Moran, and they're trying to get that going, and then they start the match, and then within a few minutes, UL Bowles have a try, and next thing it's an uphill battle you know so it probably can be sometimes a bit of a psychological thing that way as well yeah absolutely and particularly when it's elite leaders that are that are uh the team in front of you and that you know have good players and can do damage if you let them and sometimes unfortunately rugby can you know the bounce of a ball can yeah change something or the drop of a ball and just one very slight mistake leads to a try and as you say that can have a knock-on impact be it psychologically for a player or just physically and they feel like they're not up to it and and all of a sudden letting in one try almost like the dam breaks and four or five tries Mm. happen in in a very short space of time and as you said it can be hard to pick yourself back up and that's just something that I suppose you have to be able to say we're going to give everything we have till the 80th minute and for this next 10 minutes we're not going to let them score a try or we're going to get a try if it kills us to try and do this and and make sure that we get on the scoreboard and we're rewarded for our efforts. Obviously in the west of Ireland as well they'd be contending with people moving away or going travelling or that kind of thing as well and then one of those cases I was well reminded of it when I was down there was uh, Leash McGonagall who's obviously flying there in the league um, such a loss but like does that kind of thing happen often the switches between or what 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 do you think um it does happen and but it doesn't happen usually from a like uh, my team isn't winning many games i want to go play for a team that is winning most of the time the switches that we see are based on other factors so uh, particularly i think the likes of and i'm not quite sure with leisha now but i think with clara barrett is that she's actually who has also moved is also um studying down in ul so obviously it makes sense that you're not going to be traveling back and forth like you look at a uh, former irish international um let me think who we would have that came from Galwegian. It's like you even look at someone like Sene Naupu. Like she initially, when she came to Ireland, her, um, you know, she was playing with Galwegians and then a lot of her work was dictating that she'd be in Dublin and so therefore she ended up transferring uh, to Old Belvedere in Dublin and playing there. And um, that kind of stuff can be hard. Like, uh, again, Dublin is... Um, the largest city we have in Ireland it's obviously a big attraction for a lot of college students and for jobs and everything else and that does pull from other players and you do see that then the Dublin clubs benefit from that Um, you know and that can be tricky for for clubs like Galwegians Ballon Collig get hit with it too particularly how far they were Cook are really really struggling with uh, players numbers and then Wicklow as well would struggle with that being so close to Dublin and player attention can be really hard in that regard and I suppose what you just want is that the players you do have in your squad that you're putting in sessions and you're making it a fun and rewarding 
experience for them regardless of results that they enjoy going down there and so that they're not leaving your club for reasons other than obviously jobs or employment or college and stuff like that there's nothing you can do about jobs and and that sort of stuff people have to go on and live their lives and pay the bills and you hate to see them go but um yeah for some people i think it's quite rare but to move clubs just because your club isn't doing well doesn't really happen there is that sense of pride in in your club and who you you play for and, and what that means and a lot of people would see their club as part of their family yeah, you could definitely see that down in Galway in such a rich history. And um, yeah, you'll be able to find out more about that soon. But elsewhere, Ballon College 22 to nil to Setonians. That would have been a nice one to get a win over the rivals. Yeah, look, um, Ballon College had a great couple of weeks, um, you know, winning two games uh, on the trough for them and uh, allows them to just bump up the table a little bit. And it, you know, just reward for them. Mike Pediman is over them. The New Zealander took over, obviously, after Fee Hayes left. And uh, he's done a great job with them. Look, it's not always uh, going really well for them, but they have to take the positives where they where they can. And, you know, as I said, to get two wins on the trot doesn't come very often for them. So uh, they'll be very, very pleased with that and looking to kick on for the next couple of round of games. Yeah, it's nearly a win that will mean extra points because come the end of the season... The two of them will be close together, so it'll be one of those that way. Yeah, look, and I think teams are very aware of obviously who's around them in the table and what that means. And some games end up having, you know, like extra meaning behind it because of that. You want to try and distance yourselves between the next player or if you lose or next team. And if you lose to that team, are they going to leapfrog you in the table? Could that potentially mean that you're in the top four or out the top four by the end of the season and stuff like that? So teams are very aware of that going into it, what they need to do in order to stay above teams or move up places and all the rest. So yeah, Ballincoll will be delighted with that. It's an interesting one though, because even on Instagram, I saw Setonians were celebrating 10 years of women's rugby in the club. You forget sometimes how, I suppose, in the young and developmental stages, some of these clubs are. Yeah, and Setonians in particular, um, you know, 10 years is not a very long time at all. Uh, but I suppose for the women's game in Ireland, um, you know, while the women's game has been around, I suppose the club game hasn't been as strong as it has been uh, in the past. And so for them to be able to celebrate that and push through, I think we need more clubs like that. You know, we want to see less of obviously clubs like Malone not being able to field and all the rest. And we want to have more clubs uh, all around the country so that in each province we've numerous clubs and players having lots of uh, clubs to choose from much closer to their homeland and um, but yeah for Setonians it's great to see that but um, they are still very much a club that is a work in progress and uh, they're having a bit of a tough time but again this season they would have probably been hoped themselves and Wicklow would have hoped they could have pushed on from last season and it just hasn't quite clicked for them yet. Elsewhere then, Railway Union 29 to Cooks 5 down in Shaw's Bridge. Both of them were coming off of losses in the Cup. Railway obviously in the Cook, cup and Cook in the place. That was a bit of a tongue twister <laughs> there. Uh, but yeah, Railway while dominant. Not a bad display from Cook given the scoreline Railway racked up against other clubs. Yeah, um, I suppose Railway... Like you want to look at that and see what the players that they were missing and stuff like that. And that's nothing against Cook. It's just the reality of it. Um, but still for them to be able to put in a bonus point performance against Cook is a credit to a lot of their young players in the system that they're developing underage and coming through and uh, with their second team and stuff like that. For Cook, great to see them getting the scoreboard, but I would have liked to see could they push on a little bit more. They've obviously been boosted in the last uh, couple of weeks with the... Um, Return of the likes of Ilse van Staden. Kelly McCormick has been doing really, really well in the Celtic Challenge Cup and it's great to see her back um, playing with them again. But I just feel for Cook. I really want them to do well and I'm rooting for them just because of, I suppose they're quite isolated up there in Ulster and the only team playing uh, up from Ulster and they do a lot of work behind the scenes to try and keep their numbers high and... Um, you know, to put in these big performances and it can be, as I said, quite demoralising um, to come away week after week with these defeats. But I am delighted because they did get their win a couple of weeks ago, but I do still think there's another win there for them. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll be thinking the same as well. I know Tams and Boyce and Izzy Harris were a standout for them there, so they'll be hoping to build on that now ahead of the next one. But Old Belvedere bet Wicklow 25-12 to in Ashtown Lane. 
and the return of Alison Miller. Who saw that one coming? <laughs> I definitely didn't. And I think as well, another sneaky name that went onto the bench was Tanya Rosser. Um, but yeah, look, Alison Miller return. Um, it's not every day that you get to be able to bring a player out of retirement who's been inducted into the Rugby Hall of Fame uh, in Ireland. And um, look, she was a phenomenal servant for Ireland. Um, and you know one of the best wingers in the world at one point scored obviously that very very famous try in the 2014 world cup uh, to get ireland to a semi-final and beat new zealand for the first time but i think what surprised me most not wasn't her return to actually playing rugby but it was the position that she returned to which was flanker and um, you know she's always been incredibly strong and not afraid to put in a hefty challenge but I suppose I didn't expect it. She'd played um, centre and wing um, for both uh, Belvo and, and Connacht, her province, before, but I, I never really expected her to play flanker. But by all accounts, from what I heard, she played very well. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't like to be tackled by Ali Miller anytime <laughs> soon. So, uh, yeah, no, a very interesting one, but great to see it. I think it's brilliant. It's good for the game, you know. And even, like you say, Tanya Rosser there went under the radar <laughs> altogether. Yeah, completely. Like, obviously, uh, I don't know the reasoning behind that. Did she want to jump in and have a bit of fun? Were Belvo a little bit short? Um, or what was the story there? But a great story. Another player, you know, who got uh, 50 caps, like, I- incredible achievement, um, you know, went to a World Cup, won a Six Nations um, with me, went to a World Cup, obviously was part of that team in 2014. And... Uh, yeah, just it's just brilliant. Last couple of weeks, we've had the return of a couple of former internationals, and I can't wait to see who else is going to pop out of the woodwork in the next few weeks. Every team is there ringing <laughs> up all their retired internationals. You never know, Fee Hayes might drop up a pop up for UL Bows in the next couple of weeks. So who knows? The return of Hannah Tyrrell. No, though. absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me. <laughs> She's been keeping the the phone. I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, do not disturb. Um, for Wicklow, then obviously on the other side of things they found themselves in a tough spot at the bottom of the table what's gone wrong for them uh, I don't know it's really hard to pinpoint um as I said last year you know this was I think their third maybe fourth season in, in the women's AIL and you know again they're a team that put a lot of work into their structures and came through the ranks and when they first came into their first season in, in the AAL like they took a couple of heavy beatings and, and but it didn't dampen their spirits and they came back and last year they had a really good season I, I think they came fifth or so definitely a very strong mid table I think they finished just outside the top four you know had some really good results over Old Belvedere and um they have some really good players and had players in and around the fringes of Ireland squads and um, particularly the likes of Ella Roberts and they have a really family oriented uh, group out there. I think they had five sets of sisters playing at one time, but this season, I don't know what it is. They just seem, they've lost. Obviously, Neve Nadroma isn't playing for them this year. Again, a former Irish sevens player, very experienced leader, former captain for them. And I don't know, is it the loss of her? They just seem to be missing kind of that bit of it. She was a nitty gritty player who got stuck in and really annoyed other teams. Um, or is it that there's a little bit more behind the scenes? Have they lost more players um, and kind of a core group of their squad? Or is it just things aren't clicking and they maybe haven't got um, the confidence and the momentum that they had hoped to build into this season and grow a little bit? But um, I, I hope they can get out of that because they have some really good players in there. Um, you know, Beth Roberts as well was playing really well at 10 for them and a really good kicker at times. She plays fullback too and... Um, Quiva Malloy has been leading the charges for them quite well as well and I just I hope they can get things going because I'd hate for all the good work that they've done over the last few years to be undone a little bit Yeah and I suppose it's that kind of thing momentum means a lot in this game but yeah. looking ahead then to round 12 that took place on the 17th of February Ballon Colleg 36-10 to over Cook in Tanner Park Blackrock 24-10 to against Wicklow in Stradbuck and Railway knocked up 83 points against Galwegians is seven in Park Avenue. There was also UL Bows against Setonians, which is something we have to touch on, Hannah. Obviously, five match points awarded to UL, along with that scoreline, as Setonians are deducted five points for conceding the game. It's not something we like to see. No, like, and it's not great to see, I suppose. And again, I don't know the situation down at Setonians. Um, I haven't seen their team the week before. I think they could only field 
or only named 19 players I think it was uh, in all couldn't even fill their 23 in their bench um, and they're obviously having massive issues with, with getting players on the field some of that may be down to the um, Celtic Challenge Cup but it's not nice to see you, you want to be in a competitive league where each team is trying to improve itself and how teams improve themselves is where they have competitive training sessions to have competitive training sessions you need to have numbers there to be pushing each other to be driving standards and and all the rest and everyone gets better as a result if you don't have the numbers the competition isn't quite there and therefore you don't have that drive and you don't have those improvements you'd hope to see I'm hoping it's just a one-off because mm. of all the rugby and everything else that's going on and maybe just bad timing. Um, but it's not something that we want to see become a common occurrence. We saw, obviously, what all Belvedere it happened with them a couple of weeks ago in the Cup. Again, a lot of that was down to the Celtic Challenge Cup. So hopefully now that that's over, that we can kind of get back into things. But then I suppose you do have the Six Nations coming up too and will that have an effect? It's non-stop, isn't it? Yeah, this is a, a bit of a crazy rugby year, you know, and I think a lot of these players will... Uh, have earned themselves a well-deserved break uh, once it ends. Um, looking ahead then, Ballincollig, 36-10 over Cook. That took place in Tanner Park, and we have some highlights for you there. But um, obviously, that was a big win for Ballincollig, another important one. As you say, though, Elsa Van Staden back for Cook and really leading the charge there. Yeah, like, and Cook, like, they clearly are showing glimpses of what they can do. You know, they're now scoring tries on a more regular basis. You know, in the past, we would have seen a lot of, uh, or, or some of their games where they don't score at all and stuff. And that's showing us that there are improvements there. But unfortunately, the the improvements aren't coming as quite as quickly as we had obviously hoped. And, and as we said, Ballincollig obviously being spurred on by their win the week before, you know, um, putting on a hefty defeat and for Ballincollig that is quite good the likes of Roshi Norman doing quite well there mm. for them um, and Tuhig as well playing quite well and 32 points to put on any team is pretty decent just securing the bonus point win there and they come off at the back of that quite happy uh, for Cook though they know they have work to do but it's about keeping that core team together keeping their confidence going and showing them even despite the, the result and the scoreline that here's the, the positive we can take from this game and bring it into the next game and weather would have played a big part in that one. But as you say, Ball and Colleagues standouts were definitely Roshan Ormond and uh, Michelle O'Driscoll was going very well as well. Yeah, and Michelle O'Driscoll's actually done quite well. I think she's um, she played a lot of 13 for the Clovers in the uh, Celtic Challenge Cup. And I think she's one who's actually improved because of that and gotten a little confidence and is able to then take that back to her club. So it's brilliant to see that kind of thing. So while a lot of players who may play in the Celtic Challenge Cup some might be disappointed they haven't gone on to get international recognition. They still can uh, make a big difference to their club because they're coming back an improved player and then they can spread whatever mm. knowledge they've learned to other players and help everybody improve. Yeah, so it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, elsewhere, BlackRock 24-10 against Wicklow. I suppose one of the talking points here is BlackRock are still ticking away there and I know what you're saying, there's a long way to go yet, but... What do you think? Are they still within touch and distance? Because there's quite a few points there, there in the in the mix. Yeah, look, they're probably not very happy um, considering how the last few seasons have gone of where they're sitting in fourth place in, in the league right now, but you can't quite write them off. And I suppose the way that this league works with the, you just got to make the top four and anything can kind of happen towards the knockout stage of things. But um, yeah, they're just tipping away. As I said, they've really good depth there and able to call on um, players, you know, that... Um, have been really, really good club players for them over the years, um, while all their internationals or their provincials or their, what do we call them, Celtic Challenge Cup players um, <laughs> are off and still able to bring in players. And as I said, they had the return of the likes of Maeve O'Gallier on the bench to give her game time uh, a couple of weeks ago. To be able to still produce results while missing a good chunk of your players is a sign of a good team because, you know, or it's a sign of a great team, to be honest, because good teams will do well with, all of their players mm. great teams will do well when they're still missing some of their key players and and for black rock you know um they have the likes of ian madigan in there helping them out a little bit obviously he has massive experience at international level um and it's everybody who's learning from that it's not just the top players it's it's uh, every single person who's involved in the panel and i think their second team sometimes train with them as well together which helps because during these times when numbers are low it's those players who come up to the the first team and the al team and um when you can still put on in, in big numbers you know you're doing something right 
And then elsewhere, Galwegians lost out to Railway 83 to 7. That was the result we touched on earlier. But there, there was an interesting one. Matty Eger, Egberg with the hat trick of tries. And then Lindsay Pete on the scoreline, too. Yeah, look, when is Lindsay Pete not on the scoreline? I've been following <laughs> the AIL uh, try scoring or points table, and she's been slowly creeping up there the last couple of weeks. But again, Railway. A lot of players missing uh, through the uh, Celtic Challenge Cup, but to be still able to call on the likes of Claire Johan, who's a 7s and 15s international, uh, Katie O'Dwyer, who normally plays prop, but seems to be enjoying life at, I think, number six in the back row, alongside Lindsay Pete, who also normally plays prop, but is uh, enjoying herself back there at number eight. Um, scoring tries for fun and... Um, yeah, just like Neve Burns still there, obviously a very experienced player for them and, and captain over the last number of years. Um, yeah, they're just well able to do it. Stephen Costello has them well run. He's picked up obviously a good team off the back of JC the last number of years and the players practically run at training sessions themselves. I'd say they're so experienced in it, but um, yeah, they're just going quite well. And as I said, they're always up there. They're always about and come end of the season, you can't write them off. It's funny you mentioned there the 7s and 15s international. I know they had a day there recently where they celebrated all of their uh, achievements of their club. And, you know, they had Stacey Flood, Anna McGann and Eve Higgins there with the 7s World Series trophy. So, like, that just tells you everything you need to know, really. And, and that's leaving out Eve Higgins. Yeah. Uh, that's leaving out Amy Lee murphy Crow. Like, you know, they've Katie Heffernan... Um, you know, is I think Claire Bowles might be Railway Union too. Like they're all technically contracted sevens players, um, you know, and that's sevens players alone. So it's it, incredible the amount of internationals across both codes that they have, uh, both previous and current. Um, and, you know, while they're not all released to play each week, the connections they have are still quite strong. And as you said, to be able to bring them back in and be role models for everybody else and even show these younger girls potential career paths that are there whether it be 15s or 7s is brilliant and, and it's not every day that Ireland wins a trophy it, it's brilliant that was an exceptional um, it's a little side note here but for Ireland to win their first ever tournament was an exceptional exceptional achievement um, and I'm I'm so glad they got a lot of credit for it and they got a lot of media for it and everything else um, you know and I it was the first but I surely hope it's not the last love the fingers crossed here for that so uh, time for a break now here's some of our energy at AIL captains taking part in a trivia challenge stay with us name a sport beginning with the letter A archery oh. <laughs> what size is an Olympic swimming pool 50 meters who's the highest paid athlete LeBron James no good guess but no Messi no Ronaldo. Yes. <laughs> Where was the Women's Football World Cup held this year? Australia, New Zealand. Oh, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> the Olympics are held every how many years? Four. Four. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody got it. <laughs> Name an Irish Olympic or Paralympic medalist. Katie Taylor. Oh, good job. <laughs> You're watching the Her Sport Energy at AIL show brought to you by Energy. You were watching our Energy at AIL captains there taking part in a bit of trivia. But now we're going to run through the games that are coming up for you uh, before our next episode on March 13th. So on March 2nd, the Suetonians take on Old Belvedere, Cook play UL Bowes, Galwegians have Black Rock in Curly Park, and then Wicklow take on Ballancolic. While on March 9th, Black Rock versus UL Bowes, I'm sure that's a big one we'll have a look at. <laughs> Ballancolic against Railway Union, Old Belvedere versus Galwegians, and Suetonians take on Cook. But yeah, that Black Rock UL Bowes, Hannah, that's a nice one to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Look, obviously, uh, UL Bows are uh, the leading pack at the minute. You know, everybody's trying to hunt them down and, and get a scalp and a win over them to show, you know, that they're just as good. Um, and as I said, Black Rock always want to be there, thereabouts, and wouldn't be um, probably too pleased at where they are in the table. So it's an opportunity to, to climb up a little bit and, and take one from the leaders. I think it's one of them where everyone would be like, ah, go on, go on. Just, <laughs> yeah. just, just to spice it up a bit coming into the end of it. Like. Yeah, and of course, obviously you want it to be competitive right to the end, um, but you also want to move yourself up into those first and second positions in the league so you get that home advantage when it comes to the semi-finals. 
Definitely. And then elsewhere, obviously, you have Wicklow against Balancholic and Satoni against, against Cook. So there are two more, I suppose, table rivals in that way. Yeah, look, obviously, uh, for Wicklow, who are rude to the bottom of the table, they'd obviously want to try and, and get a win there and... Um, would have always seen themselves as, as you say, on the same level as Balancolic and well able. But Balancolic will be going for three in a row, and as I said, uh, we'll have that confidence and we'll be buoyed by the last couple of wins. And so that could be a really tasty challenge as well. Um, you know, for for Cook, there's an opportunity there to to try and get another win. And you do target games when you see the fixture lists come out, and and this is probably one that uh, they'll try and give what they can. Definitely. Well, we're, we'll be looking forward to that one. Um, stay tuned for coverage on her sports audio and Irish rugby as well. But just to close out, we might turn to some viewers' questions, which we, we call out far and wide <laughs> on Instagram and Twitter to see what questions you guys might have for Hannah. So we're going to delve into them now. We've one in here from Roshi Maher, who asked, what are your thoughts on the upcoming under-20s women's rugby Six Nations, Anna? Um, yeah, look, I'm I'm really looking forward to obviously all the Six Nations games that are coming up. But you know the twenties are really exciting to see some new talent uh, coming through and uh, see what potential we have for the future and can they make a, an impact in in senior international rugby. And I suppose you look at the likes of Sarah Delaney who's come through the twenties pathway and and now is a senior international. The likes of Kay Flannery, Katie Corrigan have obviously done really well underage and now they're getting their their just rewards at senior level. So um, they're the future of rugby, um, you know, the future of Irish rugby. And hopefully we have a couple of outstanding players that can bring us to the next level. Definitely. We have someone, another one in here from somebody else, two kind of quick fire ones. I'm not too sure. <laughs> uh, did they want a long answer or a short one? But we'll see what we get anyways. But the first one is, do you prefer a good handoff or a dump tackle? Um, if I was to receive, I'd rather receive, be dump tackled, I think, because uh, <laughs> the handoff is just so embarrassing. Um, and if I was doing it to somebody else, uh, tackling was never my strong suit. So I actually think I'd love to be dump tackle someone. Uh, I don't <laughs> think I ever did that in my whole career. But um, yeah, it's quite nice when you get a really good tackle that uh, drives them backwards and you win the gain line. You could get the chance yet if someone gets on the front. <laughs> no, no, I'm done. I'm retired. <laughs> um, they also asked, what's your best pre and post match snack or meal? Uh, my pre match meal is always the same. Uh, it's literally just plain pasta. No sauce, no nothing. Don't upset the belly or anything before the game. I'm nervous enough as it is. Um, snack wise, pre and post match is probably cup of tea and um a rice crispy squares bar is usually kind of the go-to something that's a bit of carbs a bit of sugar but that also tastes pretty nice perfect i hope that gave you the insight you were looking <laughs> yes. for there um somebody else asked how attractive is the energy ail to athletes in comparison to other leagues maybe from ga or soccer and why um Look, I suppose it depends what angle you're looking at it. Some people obviously love rugby and think that the energy at AAL has some fantastic um, teams and players that play in it and therefore are very exciting to watch week in, week out. I suppose our biggest problem is uh, numbers, you know, uh, that obviously Gaelic football is our national sport. It's the most played sport in Ireland and we're competing with so many clubs that are out there and therefore it's a much more accessible sport because of that. Uh, with women's rugby obviously we're a little bit behind in terms of one it being promoted but two obviously the amount of clubs that we have um, and that are then also catering to women that is changing over the number of years but I guarantee that if you were to go down to for example that UL Bowls Black Rock match in a couple of weeks and check out some of the st talent that's on in store um, and on show or same with any you know Irish Women's Six Nations match you'd see that uh, women's rugby can be an exciting game to watch with plenty of talent and um, you know and that it's well worth watching and you won't you, you know you won't uh, forget it it's probably an interesting one I'm sure they're asking because obviously as well you've played nearly all of those <laughs> yeah. that we've mentioned as well um, yeah look for me obviously a lot of it came down to preference you know and soccer was my first sport and then when that was gone, GAA was the next most accessible that somebody asked me to join. And then someone else asked me about <laughs> rugby and I'd never, you know, heard much about it before my 20s because of promotion. And then when I, I fell into rugby, I loved it, you know, and different sports cater for different people. And rugby is one that caters for everybody, regardless of size and ability and 
you know, all that sort of stuff. And um, as I said, you go and you play rugby, you go and you watch rugby, you you, you won't regret it. And, and particularly women's rugby, it's the most inclusive sport I've ever played. And uh, the social side of it's pretty decent as well. So I hear <laughs> if uh, if Galwegians and uh, UL Bows who were going to be visiting very soon or anything to go by, that definitely seems like the case. But for now, anyways, my thanks to Hannah for joining us here today. Uh, if you enjoyed it, be sure to like, subscribe, comment and share. But for now, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again.